Hi, Mitch Wenger back with another video on data analytics and machine learning. In this video, we'll discuss hierarchical clustering. Hope you enjoy. Okay, let's get started. Hierarchical clustering creates a decomposition of a set of data objects. We have two main approaches we can use here. First, we can work from the bottom up, so from individual data points to clusters. And we call this an agglomerative approach, bottom up. And eventually we end up with one big cluster that has everything or some certain termination condition holds. The other way is we can use a divisive approach, top down. So we start with all the objects in one cluster and then we successively split the cluster up into smaller clusters and yet smaller clusters, again, until a certain termination condition holds or until everything's broken out and you have N clusters, each with one of the data points. Now, one of the disadvantages is once a merge or split has been made, it can't be undone. So erroneous decisions can't be corrected like they are in a k-means clustering where the mean gets recalculated and then points get reallocated to different clusters. Once a split or an agglomeration has been made, it sticks. Hierarchical clustering measures for distances between two clusters a number of different ways. The minimum distance between two data points, the maximum distance between two data points in the same cluster, the mean difference in the cluster, and then also the average of all single distances between all data points in the cluster. And as you can see here, clusters can be presented as dendrograms like we saw before, or in a radial view like this. You'll often see really big complex ones displayed radially like this. Now, the user can specify how many clusters they want as a termination condition. And this is a critical decision along with where to split or merge the various groups. Now, there are a number of issues with hierarchical clustering. There is the risk that we will end up with some low quality clusters. Also, it doesn't typically scale well with large data sets, mainly because of that decision to merge or split. And that decision needs to examine and evaluate a good number of objects or existing clusters to make that next decision. So that circular dendrogram is one way, and we see that often in taxonomies. Now, there are other approaches to clustering as well. Clusters don't always end up with spherical shapes. So a chameleon approach to clustering explores the dynamic modeling of the neighborhood. We can use different types of density functions to identify clusters and their boundaries. And this can counteract the disadvantage of some of the more common hierarchical approaches. So two clusters end up being merged if we find that the interconnectivity and closeness between the clusters are highly related to the internal interconnectivity and closeness of objects within the clusters. Generally, we'll use some kind of a graph partitioning algorithm to cluster these data objects into a large number of smaller temporary clusters and then combine and merge these subclusters with an agglomerative approach using some type of algorithm. So you can actually use a K nearest neighbors type approach here to build a chameleon type cluster as well. Your data objects end up connected to each other. One object ends up among similar objects of another cluster. You can use a neighborhood radius approach to evaluate the density of the region to help find the clusters. And in a very dense region, well, that neighborhood is gonna be defined very narrowly and tightly. In a sparse region, it'll be defined a little more loosely, widely. So you could kind of say the boundaries of the dense region end up being more well-defined. They have more physical mass. DBSCAN is another approach. It stands for Density-Based Spatial Clustering of Applications with Noise. 
that's another one that's agglomerative in nature. So DB scan, as it turns out, is actually one of the most common clustering algorithms in use today, and it's also widely cited in the scientific literature. dbscan takes the approach that it continues to grow given clusters as long as the density, the number of objects or data points in the cluster or in the neighborhood exceeds some kind of a threshold. It can also discover clusters with arbitrary shapes due to the fact that it's not using distance between data objects for the clustering, it's using a density approach. So a simplified summation of how it works, check the neighborhood of each point in the database, build a set of satisfying looking neighborhoods, and then evaluate those neighborhoods against each other and merge them if it looks like there may be a connection. And the last clustering technique uh, we'll talk about is called a grid-based approach. One example of that is called STING, a statistical information grid approach. And in this case, we divide the object space into a finite number of cells, and we lay them out in a grid-type structure like you see in the picture there. So the spatial area gets divided into rectangular cells with a hierarchical structure. And this can be computationally efficient. We can collect the statistical information about the attributes in each rectangular grid cell and then compute those, store them away for use in supervised approaches you might use with those cluster designations. So that is an advantage. That whole grid structure facilitates parallel processing. So you can make use of parallel processing uh, with this approach, incremental updating of your grid space. So the processing speed ends up being completely independent of how many data objects you have in your data space. So the method, again, is efficient. Sting only goes through the data space once to compute all the statistical parameters. And then the queries coming out at decision time are much smaller due to the small number of uh, grid cells we have at that lowest level. In the case of Sting and these grid-based approach, the shapes of the clusters are going to be either horizontal or vertical in orientation. You won't have any diagonal boundaries at the edge of a grid-based cluster. So in essence, you end up with a layout of the clusters that's similar to the decision space you would see in a tree-based approach. And as a matter of fact, dendrograms work well with both these approaches. So that is our discussion of hierarchical clustering. I hope you found it informative. Be sure to check out the other videos in this series.